Well, agriculture and, of course, food and agriculture are right at the heart of all human affairs. I mean, they affect absolutely every aspect of human life. They also affect absolutely every aspect of the biosphere. Therefore, we should have a very broad conception. It, sh we should ha it has a moral dimension, very strong moral dimension, a metaphysical dimension. How do we really regard the world? Obviously political, obviously economic, as well as, of course, cultural. Well, just about everything's wrong with farming as it is today, actually. I mean, it would be perfectly possible, in fact, almost easy, technically, to ensure that everybody in the world has enough to eat. Not only now, but forever. And, uh, well, we clearly don't do that. There are seven billion people on, on the planet, on the Earth, of whom one billion are constantly uh, in danger of starving. There's about another billion who have all sorts of things wrong with them, diet-related. Population of diabetics at the moment is a, more than twice the total population of Russia. I mean, that's quite a striking sort of statistic. It's cruel, I mean, it's, you know, it's really foul for, for animals. It's destroying the entire biosphere. Um, something like a third of the um, soil in the world is, is said to be seriously degraded. It's a major contributor to global warming. Everything's wrong. A few people get very, very rich. A lot of people get very, very poor. There's about a billion people living in urban slums who are largely ex-farmers or their families kicked off the land. Everything's wrong. And yet, it will be easy to feed everybody, not only now, but forever, if only we did things properly. Well, present-day agriculture is called conventional, which is a sort of peculiar term given that it's very, very new, and agriculture is possibly 30, 40,000 years old, depending on how you define it. So it's a novelty, what we've got now, but it's called conventional nevertheless. A better term, a more accurate term, would be um, neoliberal industrial, because the whole point behind it, which has been around for about 200 years, is to treat agriculture simply as if it were an industry and designed simply to produce loads and loads of stuff. And um, the, it's all, that's all, and you, economically you regard it as a business like any other is the expression. Now I've got absolutely nothing against business. I think you know, virtually everything we do should be a business of one kind or another. But around 20-something uh, years ago, no, 30, 35 years ago now, uh, the, 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 the particular economic system known as neoliberalism took over the world and that says that the whole point of business, in fact the whole point of life, is to make as much money as possible in the shortest possible time in competition with everybody else. So now agriculture is conceived not as a thing that creates good food for everybody but as a thing which maximises profit in competition with everybody else. That is vile. Now if you go down the neoliberal industrial route then you say we've got to maximise output because we're trying to maximise profit and to a large extent profit is related to how much you sell. And you've got to be what you've got to minimise costs. And then you say you would define efficiency in terms of the of the ratio between the costs and the the the, the payback, you know, the profit. That's, that is considered to be very, very efficient. In order to minimise costs, you sack people. Basically, that's what it amounts to. It's called, it's called being labour efficient. In, or, uh, in order to make that work, you introduce more and more high-tech industrial agriculture, uh, sorry, industrial chemistry, and uh, big machinery, and so on, and smart machinery. And these, of course, become major industries in their own right. You soon find that agriculture has got nothing much to do with producing food at all. Certainly got nothing to do with looking after the biosphere. Certainly got nothing to do with looking after real human beings living in communities. Everything to do with making a lot of money in practice for a few people. And with, with as few people as possible employed and with more and more machinery. What this amounts to, you then say, well, if you're going down this route, you've got to go for economies of scale. Because if you're using loads and loads of industrial uh, chemistry and, and machines, you want the machines to be as big as possible and therefore you want the estates to be as possible, big as possible. If you're trying to um, cut down the number of people, uh, then you want the estates to be as big as possible, so that one person runs um, 
you know, a, a huge area. An example would be in, for example, in Lincolnshire, um, whereas a hundred years ago you might have found perhaps a hundred farms on an area of, let us say, 2,000 hectares, about 5,000 acres. Nowadays you might find one person only employed looking after that whole area. In general, there are three ways to bring about major changes, and that a major change is what we need, cross-the-board changes. Reform on its own, useful though it is, is not going to get us where we need to be. Revolution, too dangerous, nobody wants it, you never finish up where you want to be. The third possibility is renaissance, which of course literally means rebirth. And what that means is we rethink everything we, we, we are trying to do in this life, and we start the whole thing again. Well, about, I don't know, 15 years ago, maybe less, I came up with the idea that I called enlightened agriculture. And the word enlightened has sort of connotations of the 18th century enlightenment, you know, rationality and all that. But much more importantly, it has to do with, as it were, Buddhist enlightenment and the idea of doing things that are right and fit in with the world as a whole, so on and so on. Anyway, so enlightened agriculture is the concept, otherwise known as real farming because that's shorter. And it, it's a mistake to define things too carefully, but roughly speaking, enlightened agriculture is farming that is expressly designed to ensure that everybody in the world is well fed without wrecking the rest of the world. And as I say, this is perfectly possible. Now, it has three fundamental principles, none of which I thought up. The first is that of agroecology. In other words, you treat all farms as ecosystems and you regard agriculture as a whole as a positive contributor to the biosphere. The second great principle is that of food sovereignty, which says that everybody should have control of their own food supply. And the third great principle is that of economic democracy, which is more or less sort of, you know, means what it says. Basically, it's a variation on the theme of um, social democracy. In other words, a mixed economy, etc., etc., but geared to the genuinely geared to the well-being of people and the well-being of the biosphere, as opposed to being geared to the you know the simple creation of wealth and profit, which basically finishes up with a few people. Neoliberal industrial agriculture, it's zero labour, tremendously high input both of capital and of of, of science, on the biggest possible scale, huge estates. Now, if you go down the enlightened route and you say, well, and which, which involves farming along the lines of agroecology, and you say, what is the best way to, to produce food if we want to produce food of high quality enough, but not, not necessarily the maximum amount, if we want to do it kindly without um, cruelty to animals, if we want to do it without wrecking the biosphere at large, how do we do it? And the answer is the complete opposite of, what, of the neoliberal industrial. Because the neoliberal industrial, you've got monocultures on the biggest possible scale, because machines can't handle complexity. If you go down the agroecological route, you want it to be complex and many different species as possible within any one, interacting with each other, like an ecosystem. You want the individual crops and the individual livestock to be genetically diverse. Be, uh, whereas, you know, the industrial route, you're looking for clones of, of the most productive creature. And uh, once you go down the route of complexity, you, um, need, you need lots of people working because you know, it is, it's an intricate system and you need people there to make it work. And when you say, so you need a skills intensive system and skills intensive as opposed to labor intensive. Labor intensive tends to mean you've got gangs of coolies or gangs of slaves, gangs of bonded labor doing a work which should be done by a machine because it's cheaper that way if, if they're not paid much. Whereas lots and lots of skilled farmers means you, you use the technology to do the boring bits, but you, you, know, you use your skill to make it really work. And if you go down the route of having a, a very mixed, very complex system with lots of people working there, there's no advantage in scale up. In fact, there's lots of disadvantages. So instead of having one big estate, you want lots of little farms that are all interacting beautifully with each other and all you know producing good food for everybody. 
if you go down the neoliberal industrial route and you're producing vast quantities of stuff, uniform stuff from bigger states, you want big markets that can handle it. So you finish up with all these container lorries and container ships and supermarkets and all that kind of stuff. And the, the marketing chain becomes very, very complicated while the farming becomes simpler and simpler and simpler, which of course is total opposite of what you really need. What we should be looking for is complex farms with lots of people feeding into small markets with very simplified food chains. So that's, that's the contrast. It is to me a tremendous irony that if you start suggesting we should start doing the things that enlightened agriculture demands, i.e. small mix, complicated farms, etc., etc., then the powers that be will accuse you of being unrealistic as their great term. What they mean by unrealistic is that you're, you're not focused on making money and you're not focused on making money for a small number of people, which is what they mean by realism. When people talk about capitalism, they mean sort of several different things. I mean, to some extent, they mean an ideology with fat cats and all that. To some extent, actually, all they mean is a series of financial mechanisms. Now, many of those financial mechanisms work perfectly well, could work in our favour, including the idea, for example, of the small business, including the idea of the social enterprise, including the idea of lending, you know, for good purposes. Now, all those things we should embrace. So, sure, what I'm talking about is, is not, nothing sort of revolutionary. It's just using financial mechanisms sensibly for the public good. Who doesn't think that's a good idea?